Hey everyone, Chris here. Rules lawyer is a pejorative, and it's used to describe a certain kind of player. This could apply to any number of games, but the term, as far as I know, originated with Dungeons & Dragons players as a negative playstyle that makes the game less fun for the DM and the other players. Thanks to Michael Pastor for recommending a deep dive into this topic. So, if you get accused of being a rules lawyer, it could mean a number of different things. Someone might just be accusing you of knowing too many rules of the game. According to the Urban Dictionary, that's basically what it is. Your extensive knowledge of all the rules shows up the other players at the table. And I'm not a big fan of that definition because that's not how I would describe a rules lawyer. And most sources I could find went further than you just being knowledgeable about the rules. I don't see knowing the rules well as a negative at all. It's how you interact with other players or DMs who might not know the rules as well that makes the difference. Most sources I could find define the term similarly to the way I've understood the term. A rules lawyer will attempt to use literal, often overly literal readings of the rules in order to gain advantages for their own character or disadvantage to other player characters in the game that contradict the spirit of those rules. So based on that, this topic has just become near and dear to my heart because yours truly is absolutely guilty of recommending all kinds of unintuitive interactions of rules with various character builds that I have presented on this channel, other videos as well. When the do-it-all mage slips an ally into the area of a hypnotic pattern they cast in order to make them a target of the spell, then gives them an automatic saving throw with careful spell metamagic, and then grants them a reaction attack with voice of authority from a dip in order domain cleric, I am recommending a tactic that is absolutely not intuitive by taking advantage of a literal reading of the rules to create an advantage for your character. In that video, I take some time to show how a careful reading of the rules allows this unlikely strategy. I mean, if you read Voice of Authority, it doesn't say the spell you target with your ally needs to be a Bless spell or a Cure Wound spell, but I think that was likely the idea behind the feature. With my Terran Scare build, I recommended the Dragon Fear feat for the variant Dragonborn races from Fizzbins. I guess I shouldn't say they're races, there are multiple variants of the same race. You see, there, I'm doing it again. Anyways, these variants can use their breath weapons to replace a single attack from the attack action when using extra attack. Dragon Fear allows you to replace that breath weapon with a mass fear effect. But Dragon Fear was published in Xanathar's Guide to Everything in 2017, and the Dragonborn variants were published in 2021. And there's simply no way that when they published this feat, they were expecting it to replace a single weapon attack. They were assuming it would be a replacement for the one action breath weapon from a player's handbook race that is widely considered one of the weakest in the game. Now there's a couple examples, but I could probably go through a hundred of my videos where I explain these kinds of rules interactions that use literal readings to gain advantages in the game. So does that make me and players who take advantage of rules interactions I point out in videos rules lawyers? Listen, the term has no official meaning, but I think at least there's a majority opinion that rules lawyering isn't something I put into a build. Or you noticing that a rule allows something that maybe wasn't obvious to the casual reader. It's a negative behavior that occurs when interacting with the DM and the other players. I have witnessed this behavior, unfortunately, many times. Or even read comments from players who bragged about this kind of behavior, and to me, it sticks out like a sore thumb. There's a reason why the term rules lawyer is pejorative. Rules lawyers make the game less fun for the other players and the DM, and this can happen in multiple ways. I've been talking about unintuitive rules interactions, but there is a difference between a rules interaction that isn't obvious and one that's absurd. Where that line is might vary from player to player and DM to DM, but when you insist on that absurd reading without regard to the other players or the DM, then you're being a rules lawyer. Let me give you an example. Okay, so let's say you have a monk and you're at least 9th level. So you get the unarmored movement improvement that allows you to move along vertical surfaces without falling during your movement. So you could grapple a creature and then run up a wall, then let yourself fall with the creature, use your slow fall feature to not take falling damage, but the creature you grapple takes falling damage as normal. Okay, that's not too weird. And the creature takes like a d6 or 2 of falling damage and that's not a big deal. And it's kind of cool. 
But let's take it to the extreme. So let's say we have a large sized creature and we drag it up 10 feet up along a wall and we just let it drop. And I don't mean releasing the grapple, mind you. We were just lifting it into the air before and now we let it drop to the ground while maintaining our hold on it. Well, you don't need slow fall at all. And if we look at the grappling rules, a large sized creature occupies 10 feet, so it's still within our reach. So the grapple isn't broken. So maybe we lift it again and drop it again and again. And again, the dragging and carrying rules under grapple don't really cover making a grapple creature move within your reach. Most commonly, I think DMs have the grappler use their own movement to do it. You know what monks have? Lots of movement. And step of the wind as a bonus action to get a lot more. Put a haste spell on this monk. And even with double cost for movement while carrying, while grappling, that could be a lot of drops. Make them a tabaxi for good measure and they can double their movement rate. So... Let's say we have 40, double to 80. Actually, let's give them a long strider spell. So 50, double to 100. Then we double it again to 200 because of haste, plus a bonus action dash for 400, and then a hasted action dash. And now we have a 600 movement. We have to half it for carrying a grappled creature. So we have, what, 300 left? So 30 10 foot drops in one turn for 30 d6 damage. Oh, and whoopsie, the DM let us pick our own magic items. Big mistake. Boots the speed to double the movement, now at 60 drops for 60 d6 damage. You can fall from 1,000 feet in the air, and the damage maxes out at 20 d6. But here we're talking about 60 d6, and I mean, that's pretty silly, right? And it absolutely is taking advantage of a super literal reading of the rules, including taking advantage of what the rules don't say. Like, there not being a rule for moving a grapple creature within your reach means... The DM has to make a decision how to handle that. And if they say you use your own movement, they probably weren't envisioning you taking advantage of their ruling in a way like this. And the whole interaction is so absurd, there's a good chance you're ruining the immersion of the other players, never mind overshadowing them. So you're making the DM frustrated, and you're inhibiting the fun of the other players for your own advantage. But if the interaction is questioned, you can point out how the rules and the DM rulings technically allow it, and congratulations, you're a rules lawyer. I use this specific example because it's an interaction in the rules I have two real-world examples of. In one case, I saw it used in a one-shot that I was participating in. In that case, the player discussed the whole exchange with all the other players and the DM before we ever played. They wanted to try it out and see how it worked in a game. And they made it clear they were fine. If anyone was uncomfortable, they weren't going to play it. They'd play something else instead. That's not what rules lawyers do. Colby and I wanted to test the playtest monks when Jeremy from Insight Check invited us to a playtest. We talked a lot before playing, and grapple and drag tactics were absolutely discussed. In fact, we discussed what we call shenanigans in general, and how far we should push the rules in our playtest. Colby, I thought, said it great. He said... I don't want to grapple enemies, run up walls, and make them fall for d6 damage 52 times around. I just want to punch stuff into a pack of spirit wolves. Now, what Colby is saying is that he didn't want to do that. But what he's not saying, but as another player in the same game I can pick up on, is he doesn't want me to do that either. Now, as it happens, I didn't want to do that either, and I was glad to hear he was on the same page. But let's say that wasn't the case. Whether I take advantage of this rules exploit or not, regardless of the preference of the other players, is the difference. If I was to make the grapple and drop monk, I mean, Colby, you didn't say I shouldn't do that. You just said you didn't want to. Well, then I'm being a rules lawyer. I mean, I've gone further than just ignoring the spirit of the rules. I've also ignored the spirit of his comment by taking it overly literally. Shame on me. And I've absolutely experienced this kind of behavior in games I've played in, where it's like, haha, the rules let me do this ridiculous thing, so I'm going to do it, with no consideration how anyone else feels about them doing it. Now that said, there's nothing wrong with noticing and talking about potential absurdisms in the rules. It's insisting on the overly literal interpretation, even when it doesn't make sense, regardless of the feelings of the other players, that makes it a negative behavior and makes you a rules lawyer. So that's one example of being a rules lawyer. Here's another. So the DM describes the big baddie, a sword master with a vorpal blade, 
and they're swinging it with lightning speed. And the player says, I shoot the sword with an arrow. DM, what? You can't shoot the sword. Player, yes I can. Chapter 9, Player's Handbook, Making an Attack. The player picks a target within the attack's range. A creature, an object, or a location. The sword is an object, and I shoot it. The rules allow it. DM, well, the swordmaster moves the sword so fast that you can't hit it with an arrow. Player, is the sword made of steel? DM, uh, yeah, I guess. Glowing steel? Player, okay, so chapter 8 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Steel objects have an armor class of 19. I have a plus 8 to hit using sharpshooter. There, I rolled a 15, that's 23. That hit even an adamantine sword. Doesn't matter how fast he moves it, it's got its own armor class. DM, I don't think you can choose to attack objects unless they're unattended. Player, the rules don't say that. They just say you can target an object. The sword is an object. DM, well, fine, then the arrow bounces off harmlessly. Player, nothing in the entry for Vorpal Swords say they're unbreakable. And it's going to be a small object. That's 3d6 hit points maximum. You know how much damage my arrows do. His sword is destroyed. How do you like that, Swordmaster? I just broke your Vorpal weapon. Okay, so here the player is telling the DM not just what the rules are, but how they have to interpret them. That is not how D&D works. Not that DMs always make good calls. Sometimes they make terrible calls. And sometimes DMs make mistakes. And if I'm the DM and I make a mistake and you point it out, that's fine. But if I say you can't shoot the sword because I don't want that to be in my game, then that's it. If I'm the DM and I consider held objects to be off the table for targeting with attacks, it doesn't matter that the rules don't specify that. I'm filling in that gap. And if you point out the rules don't say that, that's fine. But if you argue with me about it, now you're being a rules lawyer. Now, if I'm a player and the DM decides attended objects can be attacked, I mean, I'll probably caution against that ruling because it does open a can of worms that the DM might not be considering. But in the end... It's their decision to make, and I'm not going to argue it with them. And that brings us to the third example. I have a build on this channel called the Dread Necromancer. The purpose of this build is to keep the theme of the typical necromancer, but avoid the hordes of skeletons that aren't so table friendly. The Dread Necromancer uses their Undead Thralls feature to enhance the Summon Undead spell instead of Animate Dead. As viewers have pointed out, this interaction may not work because Undead Thralls works on an undead you create, and the Summon Undead spell isn't necessarily creating undead. I mean, summon, when used in D&D anyways, usually means you're summoning them from somewhere else, so the undead spirit already exists, and then the spell is just transporting it to you and giving you control. In which case, a careful reading of this feature would not allow it to work with the Summon Undead spell. Astute viewers of that video pointed that out. And pointing that out in the comment section of my video is great. I made an assumption when making the build that the rules interaction worked. And letting me and the other viewers know that there's a possible problem with the rules interaction lets us know that we should probably have a discussion with the DM to make sure that it's okay with them before we actually play this character. But what if you're in a game? If you point out the other player character shouldn't be getting that benefit and the DM and other players assure you that They've already discussed it and it's fine. That's where the conversation should end. Make an issue out of it, you're being a rules lawyer. All that said, I don't think being knowledgeable about the rules or even sharing that knowledge in-game as a player is being a rules lawyer. Someone on my Discord used the term rules consultant and I kind of like that. I happen to have memorized a lot of little details in the rules. So if I'm playing a game and there's a question as to whether a spell hits that potential target around a corner, well, I happen to remember that Fireball specifically states it goes around corners, and Synaptic Static doesn't. So I can save players having to look that up, or the DM having to make a ruling on the spot. And I don't consider that being a rules lawyer because I'm not making the game less fun for anyone, and I think that's ultimately what it's about. Rules lawyer is a negative term because it's describing a negative behavior, it's always making the game less fun for someone else, and if that's happening, then it doesn't matter if you're technically correct about how a rule is worded or not. And you're going to find out that a lot of players and DMs just don't want to play with you. Any discussion about the rules 
involves a shared agreement around the table on how a rule ought to work, regardless of the specific literal reading of the rule. And if you don't come to a shared agreement, then the DM has the unenviable job of making a ruling, whether it conforms to the literal reading of the rules or not. And it is a player's responsibility to ultimately accept that ruling, even if you disagree. And if you find that the DM's just making a ton of bad rulings and it's ruining the fun for you, but it's not ruining the fun for the rest of the table, then maybe go find a different table to play at rather than ruining everyone else's experience as well. Now, if you have your own examples of people being rules lawyers in games you've played in, or maybe you have different opinions on what the term means than I do, then share them in the comments and we can discuss it. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. I'll talk to you soon.